Hello and welcome to another art lesson. Today we'll be creating a painting of the amazing John Coltrane in an expressionistic style using acrylic paints. Before we get into it though, if you love art, then you might want to check out the rest of our lessons at montmart.net. They are in the TV category and we have our Facebook and our art club, The Creative Connection, attached also. So, print out the accompanying PDF, grab your materials, and let's have a bit of fun. The PDF outlines the colours used, but in this project I'm using the Dimension Series Acrylic. This paint has the viscosity of butter and dries very quickly. I'm applying the background with a float and although it looks like I'm applying it in a fairly casual, haphazard way, I have a fairly solid idea of where I want my colours to end up. For example, I want that blue emitting from where the head will be. And I want there to be an orange base in the general vicinity of where the sacks will lie. I want green to the right and red to the left. Incidentally, these are companion colours. And as is the way with expressionism and abstract art, their success really does rely on colour theory in most cases. Drag that paint around until you're happy and avoid undue contamination by running your float under the water or dipping it into a bucket of water. Because Dimension Acrylic has additives to speed the drying, I give it a bit of a spray to control this and keep the paint workable. I can then fine tune the undercoat with a palette knife by dragging colours over adjoining ones. Well that looks pretty great, I'm happy with it, I don't want to go any further. The next step, which is optional, I've decided I'm going to add a little bit of a glitter paint. Now I know that sounds a little bit tacky, but the colour is very subtle and it really does enliven the coat. So let's get that on. Acrylic glitter paint can be thought of as a sort of varnish with glitter suspended in it. So it creates depth to the underlying colour while adding a shimmer at the same time. It's quite subtle, but you certainly notice the difference once it's applied. I spread this roughly with that palette knife. Time now to transfer our drawing onto our canvas under painting. Now I have created a fairly accurate drawing that you can download from the link above me or alternatively you can find it at our website in the TV category. Now one of the problems with transferring a drawing onto acrylic is acrylic paint is fairly slippery and has no tooth so I recommend that you use a pastel and I've just sharpened this to a point. I also get lots of inquiries on how to upsize a drawing and put it onto canvas. Now you can do like me and draw it in directly using the point measurement system or you might like to create a grid and upsize it and transfer it like that. And if you'd like more information I've put up another link with an instructional video to help you there. Or you might also like to project it with an overhead projector. In all honesty, I think the drafting stage is the hardest part of the project and it's really got to be right before you add the paint. Keep the pastel sharp and get into the habit of walking back and continually assessing your work. Incidentally, I will say most of our projects can be done at a smaller or larger scale too. In this drafting stage, I lay in any highlights and shadow areas as well. Time now to add our paint. Now all of the colours that I'll be using will be in that PDF, but the first step is to reinforce our pastel lines with Payne's Grey. And I like to use Payne's Grey because it's got a little bit of warmth, so let's get that on. <coughs> now one would think that pastel powder would compromise the adhesion of the key line paint, but it doesn't. Mix the paint with water so it is the viscosity of cream and you will find that it soaks through the fine powder and keys to the underlying base. Some of the lines come out a little coarse and fuzzy, but that's not a problem on a work such as this. 
Obviously, you can add more detail at this stage, especially to that saxophone. Saxophones are complicated things, but you only need to suggest the detail, not slavishly put it all in. This treatment can also be put to practice when it comes to suggesting any shines and shadow areas on the sax. Reflected light plays in a funny way on metallic curves. The trick is to simplify and stylize. I like to use a flat to do this. Incidentally, you might like to print out some reference photos of saxophones so you can familiarize yourself with this light play appearance. You might also like to listen to some of Mr. Coltrane's music as you paint also. The colors on the face are blue, green and purple. The blue being the lightest tone lies in the highlights. Even though we are substituting differing colors instead of natural hues, the tones still need to be the correct value. What I mean is every color has a tonal value. If you were to look at a black and white version of this painting, the tonal values would suggest form. So regardless of the colour, the plane on the side of the face where it meets the front plane will show as lighter. I add white to suggest this. I like to use the biggest brush I can as I'm less likely to be restrained and finicky. It's more about an economy of brush strokes. One must also think in terms of blocks of colour. For this style to be convincing, there is not really any blending per se. This reinforces a sense of immediacy to the viewer. Next, I add the green. In this case, monastral green, mixed down with a little bit of white. This will lie on the side plane of the face. I allow areas of the underpainting to show through in parts to create interest and to reinforce the fact that the top coat amalgamates with the undercoat rather than obliterating it. I think a colour is a bit like a musical note. Individually, each one has its inherent qualities that don't change. But when you put one next to the other, it can become sweet or it can become sour. For the low key tone, I'm using straight purple. Green and purple are great friends. They love to play with each other. Each one complements the next. This is how lime green and purple sound when they play together. <laughs> So I add a little vermilion red into the negative area around Mr. Coltrane's head. Remember the theory too that warm colours advance, so this really makes the head pop out. I then lay in a cool phthalo blue glaze in around the far side of the head. This helps convey perspective even more. I then drop in some lemon yellow into that saxophone. Again I let the underlying tone show through. And this is especially effective in suggesting the look of metallic shine. As I add colour into the sax, I drag the brush so the pigment runs free of colour in parts. This broken colour adds to the interest and creates variation. My colour application is fairly intuitive at this stage. And like the black, I don't need to put in every little bit of colour. Because that background is a warmish red orange, the yellow sits beautifully with it. I just build up the colour until I'm happy. I then add some pure titanium white in spots. This obviously suggests the highlights of pure reflected light that show themselves. Remember the old adage, paint what you see, not what you think you see. I then add some colour and variation to the background. I can't remember where I read it, but this little piece of advice has always stuck with me. On viewing a finished painting, you should be able to crop an area the size of a stamp and on any portion of the picture, regardless of it being the background or the focal point, it should be interesting to look at. Okay, time for lime green and purple again.
Again, follow the tonal value theory and think about light source. Incidentally, this hand has been enlarged to force the perspective a little more and make the viewer feel like they are really close to Mr. Coltrane, witnessing a very intimate performance. Well, I really hope you enjoyed this lesson and I hope you're inspired. Stay tuned, subscribe and remember to keep on painting.